bicycles. Please welcome Denise Tashiro. and they're all started by these unlikely suspects. Like, look at Offset, because it was started by a couple of profs at UBC, or, or Spud, which was started by a consultant. And what I love about Vancouver is the kind of place where you can self-define as, as an environmentalist and start a business, and, and nobody gives you a funny look. <coughs> I started my career about 15 years ago. I was the policy geek, the policy director for the Recycling Council of BC. And at the time, we were lobbying the, the province to expand the de deposit legislation for bottles to get better recycling and higher rates. And something that struck me while I was doing that is, is fundamentally I had no power. And I had no power in a very practical way in that we had no power over the design, the packaging, or the product that was ending up in municipal waste streams. But I also had no power in that traditional way. You know, we'd call Coke and Pepsi and their lobbyists and, you know, they, they never really called us back. And, <laughs> you know, it wasn't all that surprising, but, but I left that experience and I went into the corporate world, and uh, I, I got a job at Mount Clement Co-op as their director of sustainability, and it was really refreshing to find out that when you call people from a retailer that has like a quarter of a billion dollars in sales every year, they call you back, uh, you know, right away. And, and it was amazing to me, and it was so useful when you're trying to drive change to have that kind of persuasive power. And you're also a lot more, you know, you're a lot closer to the product and the stuff itself, and you know, at Mount Clement Co-op, there was a gal there named Ann Gillespie, fa fabulous gal, and she decided, right when I got there, to kind of punt the Hanes Beefy Tees out of the t-shirt line and, and bring in the MEC branded organic cotton t-shirts. And there was no environmental group telling her to do it, and, and the government wasn't telling her to do it, but she was the buyer, and she had the power to make that choice. But she told me another lesson, and it was such a critical lesson for me, because what I realized is that the Hanes t-shirts were actually ugly. They were unisex, they were boxy, and she brought in beautiful t-shirts. And they were a nice color, and they fit well, and they were 11 bucks. And they sold really well, not just because they were organic, but because they were nice. And she really told me that you just you can't sell product just because it's got good values, it's got to be good. And I'm going to illustrate this, what I see the power of product by asking you guys some questions. You're going to have to put up your hands again. I think there's really three things that are the key driving challenges to the, to the planet right now. Water scarcity, climate change, and poverty. So I'm going to ask you, if you think water scarcity is kind of the source of all evil right now, put up your hand. If you guys think poverty is it, put up your hand. All right. If you think climate change, put up your hand. So you know, you're all putting your hands up at different times. And if I was in Australia, people might put up their hand for water scarcity before they do it here. But the fact of the matter is, it depends on where you grew up. It depends on who you are and what you're passionate about in, in, in terms of your values. But at the end of the day, um, there's one thing that will get all your hands up, and it's if I ask you, who here had a cup of coffee or mug of tea in the last couple of weeks? You know, who here has uh, gotten a new piece of clothing this year, or maybe used a pen? And you're all putting your hands up, and it's sort of this creepy thing that products, you know, are this common currency, but they really do bring us together as people. We use stuff, and now imagine if a second, you know, just kind of think about it. What if that stuff could be all good? And, you know, we co-founded Fairware about five years ago. And we decided to take on the swag world, you know, the stuff we all get. That's what that stands for. And, uh, you know, if you ever asked me 10 years ago when I was getting my graduate degree in environmental management if I thought I'd be a swag baron, I would have laughed. <laughs> you know, a couple of things happened to me that, that really motivated me. And the most meaningful one was I was at an event at this beloved financial institution, and I won't name names, but they're world renowned for their social and environmental responsibility. <laughs> and I won the door prize, and I got a piece of swag, and it was actually a nice piece of swag. And I, I looked at the label like I'm apt to do when I get things like that, and I discovered that this particular product was made in Burma. And for those of you who might not know that, that's bad. That's really bad. It has a, a deplorable record of human rights abuses. And it's, uh, you know, people don't even send their buyers there because they're worried about their buyer safety. And I was so stunned, but it wasn't so much that it was an oversight by this company. It just struck me that, gosh, it, it really is hard to align your corporate buying with your values. And, you know, that was, that was five years ago. Now we get to work with companies like Patagonia. This is their, their head office. It's their front door. And we recently um, transitioned 4,300 of their dealer books, about an inch thick, full of paper, to a recycled paper USB drive that can be used again and again and again. And for the past three years, we've been working with another um, beloved brand, uh, Aveda, on a campaign every Earth Month. We do branded merchandise for all their spas and salons in North America and Asia. 
And it's really to mobilize money, fundraising, and awareness around this issue of access to clean water. And they're so effective at getting suppliers. We have to donate to participate to be a supplier. They get their salons to donate. It's, a, it's really quite incredible. And you know, closer to home, you know, Science World gave us a call and they said, oh, we need pad folios to put stuff in for a donor recognition program. We said, oh, that's great. We can find you some, but we could build you some. What are you doing with those old vinyl banners on the outside of your building that you're going to change over for the Olympics? Could we have them? And we cleaned them up and we built pad folios for them out of this waste, you know, waste material that was about to head to the landfill. And it's not all easy. You know, we have to deal with these issues like wages and overtime in our supply chain in Asia and here too. And this is a supply chain swag that's just starting to talk about this. These aren't $200 shoes, they're 75 cent tote bags. And you know, you do costings in, in you know, three decimal points. So it's a really tough conversation. And you know, even if you um, get the product from a great place, it's like how do people use it? And you know, I was at an event a couple weeks ago and I heard a guy from Starbucks say, we have to make the travel mug the new tote bags. Like, no kidding, buddy. 15 million of these things are disposed in the US every year. And you know, it's, it's, it's hard to change behaviors. It's convenient. Like, I'll put up my hand, I use disposable cups. And you know, we'll, we'll get the travel mugs in the hands of our clients, but what we need to do is provide those insights and those systems and those ideas to actually get people to change the behavior. Because I think everybody in this room can probably um, admit that you know, having a tra travel mug doesn't mean you necessarily use it all the time. And I, you know, we work with these cool companies all over North America, and I was thinking about what, what is one thing that unites them? in their passion for sustainability. And it's a mix. It's top-down pressure, and it's a bottom-up kind of grassroots support. And that's what Vancouver has. It has a local government that gets it, and it's got a super engaged citizenry that's so passionate about this stuff. And I, you know, I think about our mayor, and if, if anyone's an accidental entrepreneur, it's him. You know, the guy was an organic farmer, and he became a juice baron. And I think he's so <laughs> well situated to, to kind of get us there. And you know, I, you think back to this, okay, I'm an environmental manager, I'm a you know, shrine baron, um, how did it happen? It's not all that random. You know, you guys might buy a couple t-shirts every year, but our clients buy thousands. And we get to try and change the world a little bit with each and every one of them. Thanks.